Hi guys, welcome back. This week I'm going to be doing a user request video for you. I have had several queries over the last several months actually on how to paint sort of classical style Japanese armor. So that's basically what's worn by sort of traditional samurai, ashigaru, that kind of thing. I think this armor is probably one of the biggest reasons out there that there aren't more Japanese armies because a lot of people find it intimidating. It's difficult to paint. I should be frank here, it's not really, I don't think Japanese armor is really particularly difficult to paint in terms of the techniques that you need, it's just got a lot of little fine detail work sculpted into it usually, and that takes a lot of time, that's the main thing. You have to work slowly and carefully, you have to keep your paints thin, so it, it's really just, it, it's that's the real problem, it's not really hard, there's not a big secret to painting this stuff. I'm telling you this up front, if you, <laughs> if you want to skip the video now, I'm not going to show you anything really groundbreaking probably, but the main thing is it's just a lot of detail work where you have to have patience and a steady hand, and that's not something that I can really teach you in the video, so I hate to disappoint you. It's, it's really, I'm not going to be able to make painting Japanese armor any faster for you. That's, it's To get a good job, you're just going to have to invest the time, but hopefully maybe I can show you a few things that will make it a little bit easier easier for you. So here's the figure that I'm going to be using. This is a Spear Ashigaru from the Perry's very, very excellent Japanese range. Their range of Japanese figures probably one of the best out there right now in terms of sculpting and sort of comprehensiveness. And, you know, I just really, really like it. Now, I intentionally chose an Ashigaru here instead of, say, a Samurai because they're a bit simpler. And I, there's enough to worry about painting this armor, I thought that, you know, we didn't really need to get wrapped up in sort of the things that you'd expect in a more high status figure, so a samurai, because they would have, you know, more ornate fabrics, brighter colors, more metallics, things like that, that are just going to add extra work and extra time into doing this figure. So that's why I'm intentionally holding it kind of simple. But basically the techniques that I'm going to be showing you here with this figure are going to be just as applicable on samurai. The armor is basically the same. I mean, there's probably some small differences, but it's very, very similar. So you watch this, you should be able to use it to paint your samurai, and then you're just going to want to ramp up kind of the bling factor, I guess. So, like I said, more fancy fabrics and bright colors. And I have other tutorials you can watch where I do some fancy fabric painting, which you can maybe hopefully apply to your samurai if you're going to be uh, working on that. Now you notice probably, I'll show you again on the figure, I've already gone ahead and base coated him and painted his skin. People have also asked me before how to paint sort of Asian and Japanese flesh tones, but I have now covered that fairly extensively, I think. My very, very first video actually on a ronin, a samurai, showed how to paint it, but that was kind of a bad video. I know it was badly edited, badly filmed, slow, so don't blame me if you don't want to watch that, but recently I have made one on a World War II Japanese soldier where I also covered Asian skin tone, so if you need to know more about that process, you can check out either of those two videos, which I will link in the description box, so that's why I'm not going to be taking a look at that here. I think there's probably enough to do with this figure as it is that we don't need to worry about it. So I think that's pretty much everything that I need to cover, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm going to start out here with the clothing that our Ashigaru has on under his armor. Uh, Color-wise, this is really going to be dictated by what forces you're painting. The Japanese seem to have standardized the livery of their forces, because these guys were controlled by various warlords, or, you know, shoguns, or whatever, who would, you know, have their own colors. Um, I'm not going for anything particular here, I'm just making it up based on colors that I know are used a lot. So I'm going to give him sort of a bluish shirt, and the base coat I'm using here is a mixture of black and Prussian blue from Vallejo. I'm then going to layer on some pure Prussian blue, and this is not substantially different from the base color, so you don't have to worry too much about where you put it or about blending it around or anything. Just don't, you know, get it in the really deep areas under his arms and things like that. Blue is a pretty common color in 
Japan for a very long time. It still is. It gets worn a lot. And the shade that you see a really a lot of, it comes back again and again in art and everywhere. It's sort of a bluish gray color. There's definitely a gray cast. So my next highlight here takes that Prussian blue and mixes in a bit of Vallejo gray blue here. And you can see now I am going to be blending it a bit more and, you know, applying it to the sort of higher areas. And as usual, thin it a bit and uh, apply a couple of coats until you get the effect that really suits you. And then for my final highlight, I'm continue with more of the same. I've just mixed even more gray blue into my Prussian blue to get an even lighter, brighter shade. And I'm just applying it the same way, blending it out, but just a little bit less and more on the emphasis areas. Because he's wearing so much armor here and because his clothing, you know, only is pretty obscured, I'm not going to, I might, I'm not going to highlight this as much as I might in some other instances. And I'm not going to worry, you know, too much about the finishing here because a lot of it's going to be hidden. I'm then going to move on to his pants and the sort of um, cloth that's hanging down from the back of his helmet. This can be a variety of colors, and as I said before, my choices here are really based totally on what I thought would be fun, would be interesting to do, and pretty arbitrary. But like I said, if you're doing it, you're going to want to research whatever particular unit or force your painting and make your color choices based on that. But red is a color that comes back quite a bit as well on Japanese soldiers, so it's perfectly fine to use here. So I'm just basically applying a base coat here of the Vallejo Black Red, and I'm going to put that just carefully all over the pants and all over that, that head cloth. And now I'm going to highlight the red using the color combo that I generally employ, which is starting off here with a Citadel Mephiston Red and it's a base color, so it coats pretty strongly. So you may want to think about thinning it so that you can build up a little bit of extra depth and some more layers and it doesn't go on too thick all at once. But with a little practice, you can kind of do like me here and just put it on unthin and just sort of blend it out. And you can see it's gonna go pretty much everywhere. I'm just avo avoiding the really, uh, the, the, the the deepest recesses and folds in his clothing and kind of under his legs, things like that, and kind of also leaving a dark red uh, edge where uh, there's another piece of equipment, so sort of around the edges of where those um, shin guards are and uh, also on his hat, that cloth, you want to make sure it stays nice and dark in the area sort of inside uh, behind his head, basically. I'm then going to continue highlighting the red using Evil Sun Scarlet from Citadel, which is, again, a layer color, so that makes it so you won't really have to thin it very much. It should be fine right out of the bottle. And I'm just going to be focusing it here on areas where I want a lot of brilliant color. You can see how I'm especially paying attention to the knees and all of the tops of folds in his pants and, of course, on his head cloth. That's also a pretty wrinkly piece of fabric, so I'm just really always applying it to the tops of folds and creases where that's where the most light is going to be and then sort of spreading it out and blending it down from that point. With the clothing done, I'm going to move on to the armor. Uh, Japanese armor came in various colors, though a black or gray tone one seems to have been one of the most common that you see, especially on a lower status guy like this Ashigaru. Uh, I really like painting red myself, but you know, we're going to be doing the more standard black here. And the finish was generally lacquered, which is why you see this color range. Um, I'm not sure what the base material was. I know it was metal or some composite or something. Anyway, uh, my base coat here is a mixture of Vallejo black and again that blue gray. And I'm doing that because I want to get a sort of slight tone to the gray and black. I don't want it just to be, I, you know, I want it to you know, have a little bit more interest and depth, and I wanted to choose a color that's already going to complement, particularly that blue shirt, where there's, you know, so it goes with the bluish cast to the shirt, and it'll make everything feel a bit more unified when I'm finished. I'm going to start highlighting here using a mixture of German gray and again the blue gray color. And I'm going to be applying that pretty much everywhere. The only place you can see I'm not really putting the color is sort of in the areas that are just dividing the different armor segments because we want to keep a clear, dark line there. Um, you don't have to do too much blending here. Maybe a little bit on the back because you 
don't, you have a big solid area and you don't want it to look just too concentrated and solid. The other place you want to be careful here is you can see the segments that he's wearing around his waist. They're kind of held together by cord work. And you can see what I'm doing. I'm just drawing a line along the top of each segment and as a way of sort of a highlight. And that's because we want those gray areas to have a little highlight and a little contrast, but most of that area is going to be hidden and obscured by all the cords we're going to paint in later. So you don't really have to worry about it a lot, but you want to do a little bit of something there so then when we go back over it with the and paint the cords later, you're still going to get a little bit of something going on in the gray. Another area that you need to be careful of blending is going to be the helmet because it's a big area and an awkward place and it can be hard to get a good blended transition. What I like to do with things like this often is to apply the color, to water the color down so it's quite thin and apply uh, several layers, uh, building it up to get more lightness and more color progressively towards the top or the bottom or whatever you want. And it's just because doing blending like I do on the surface and spreading out and feathering out is, is much more difficult on an object like that. So I just find it altogether simpler to do it that way. Once I finish my base highlight, I am going to mix even more blue-gray into that color I already had. And you can see now I'm focusing it sort of towards the top of the armor segments and then blending it downwards or blending it out so that those different plates get a, a, a sort of a, uh, you get the idea that the, there's one color it sort of transitions into another one. And that's not necessarily because light hits it that way, but it keeps the pieces looking a little bit more interesting and it just gives them some gradation and, you know, it just basically adds variety to what you're doing. I'm going to finish the armor off using an edge highlight, and I've made this by taking that blue-gray color and then just mixing some of my German gray into it, so I'm kind of going the opposite way. And you can see, if you look carefully, that there's a very clear blue cast to it now, but I'm applying it so finely, it doesn't really matter. And this color is really going to be exclusively used to edge all of these armor pieces, so you're going to want to thin it down quite a bit so that it flows nicely when you're applying it. Uh, on armor like this, you really want to do something like this you need you want to you want to really make sure you distinguish all of the bits and plates and stuff if you watched my tutorial I did some time ago about painting metal armor I was basically doing the same thing I was fine lining all the different segments except it was at that point it was with sort of a white silver color but on any sort of segmented armor this is in my opinion a real must because it helps just add extra definition and sort of an extra edge highlight to the, those areas so I, I, I mean it, it's a little bit fiddly but I really recommend it and it's a good practice for your brush control and it'll, it'll just it'll just make the armor look altogether better if you go through with this step and now for all the cord work um, on the armor and this is a major feature obviously of Japanese armor that they use a lot of sort of a fabric knotting and ties and string to hold together the segments of their armor and you see that especially on the pieces sort of around his waist and upper leg protection there's a lot of cords there, and that's to make those segments extra flexible they just sort of hang there and there's some other cords at the shoulders and sides you don't want to forget those this this thing here is probably why people hate painting Japanese armor because doing this is time consuming, it's fiddly, it's easy to mess it up and make the whole armor look bad. Uh, yeah, so this is probably the biggest time consuming element on painting Japanese armor. I am going to be painting blue cords on my armor here because we already have sort of a blue theme going. I want to continue that. I've made a base coat here by mixing my Prussian blue with some of the gray blue and a more or less sort of 50-50 mix, I guess. And I thinned it down a lot. It's really important that the color is really thin so it goes on really easily when you're doing this. Otherwise, you're going to have a miserable time. And I'm just very carefully, very fine, and very, you know, just taking, really take your time and then e picking out individually each of, each of those little lacings with your base color. And then I'm going to go back in and I've taken now the gray blue and I have mixed more in to get a, a substantially lighter color, as you can see. And I'm going to go back over. Again, with very thin paint, that's critical. This paint has to be thin for this to work and carefully go over the top. In this case, I will put the paint sort of towards the top of the knot and then, and then pull it downwards. That way you get a little color variation. This, these areas are so small, you're hardly gonna see it, but it doesn't hurt to try. So it's again, so I'm just going back over it and there's no secret here. 
just make sure you, you go slowly and you always use really thin paints. It, this is just about patience and good brush control and that's all there is to it. And it sucks that, that there's no faster, better way to do this. But if you want to have really nice results, this is pretty much the technique you're going to have to employ. When I'm finished, I took some pure blue gray, which was again thinned down, and I sort of put that on my brush. And then you can sort of highlight the tops of the knots just by very, very lightly, I mean very lightly, touching sort of the top edge of the knot, sort of with just the, sort of the side of your brush. Um, if you do that, then the color won't get down in the cracks at all, and you can just very sort of light, use the sort of light touch approach on these raised areas just to apply a little tiny extra bit of highlight to tops if you want to. And again, if you make a mess, don't worry about it too, too much. You can kind of go back and clean it up by taking some bl uh, black or German gray or whatever and, and kind of putting it down in the cracks. I made a couple mistakes here and I had to go and clean it up, but your goal should be not to do that any more than you have to because it's, it's, you know, it'll just work better if you can get it right the first time. I'm now really quickly going to go in and take care of his uh, sword and dagger and the sheaths that they're in. Um, these were painted a variety of colors as well, but I'm just going for a basic black, dark gray just to keep things simple. I want it to be totally a little different from my armor, so I'm not going to mix any blue in here. And I want it to stay fairly dark, so I'm going to base coat these areas first with black. And that includes the grips and the and the scabbard. I'm then going to make a mix, sort of not 50/50, but black with a bit of German gray in. That's going to be sort of my second shade. And then I'm going to apply pure German gray, sort of as a highlight color, and then finish off with an extreme highlight with a bit of neutral gray from Vallejo added into my German gray, but not too much because I want to keep this subtle and I want it to feel definitely quite dark, especially compared to the armor. And on the grip, you're going to want to pick out sort of the wrapping, the handle wrapping, which you can really clearly see in the sculpt because that'll just make everything look a little better and add a little bit of nice detail. Um, you might have noticed that at the beginning of this video, his feet were not painted, and now they are. Uh, that is because a lot of times these guys wore sort of a split-toed sock. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's kind of white or cream colored, and that is what you'll see in the majority of models, but... This guy was a little weird. He actually was barefoot, but I didn't notice that till later, so I had to kind of go back in in between and paint his feet. But now that that's done, I'm gonna move on to his sandals. Uh, sandals were different things. Sometimes you see uh, sort of a black gray strapping type sandal, and sometimes you see this sort of brownish sandal, and that's what I'm gonna be doing here. So I'm going to be painting both the sandals and sort of the strap holding his helmet on here using the, the Foundry Rawhide Triad. So it's real. these are very small, tiny, not very well defined areas, so don't worry about it too much. I'm just going to basically base coat them with the Rawhide Shade and then I'm going to go back in first with Rawhide Medium to sort of pick out the straps a little bit more, just really avoiding the areas, a few areas where there's divisions in the straps so you can keep that dark color really show that they're still there. And then I'm finally gonna go back in with the raw high light and I'm gonna apply that a little bit more sparingly, just kind of, kind of dotting it on in this case because these areas are so tiny, just to add some extra highlight sort of to the real tops and edges of these straps. Now our Ashigaru has various sort of straps or sort of bindings, I guess, which help hold on pieces of his armor and also his sash that he's wearing around his waist. Uh, these would have been various colors, but I'm going to go with sort of a creamy white in this case because I think it gives a nice contrast. Uh, these are very small, very fine areas, so there's not too much rocket science here in painting these. You don't have to worry too much about blending or anything. It's really just about being careful and, you know, carefully applying your paint to the areas and you know then we're going to do a little basic highlighting but I'm going to start out with a base coat of foundry uh, boneyard medium here just you don't even have to really thin the paint down too much just enough so it goes on easily I'm just going to very carefully just uh, pick those uh, areas out to start with and then in order to sort of just improve the contrast on these pieces, get a little bit more depth to the bindings, I'm going to apply a, a fairly reasonably strength wash of Seraphim Sepia to all of the wrappings and bindings. And once that's dry, I'm going to continue by highlighting all of the straps 
using boneyard light. In this case, the boneyard light pretty much is gonna go everywhere except where there are the folds and creases, just, you know, just picking out the, the top level of the fabric, not worrying too much. As I said before, these areas are really too small for blending, so it's really just about, you know, a, some careful brush work and not getting the paint down in those recesses that you created from applying the wash. And I'm just gonna finish off the wrappings now by taking a bit of white and sort of applying it just very sparingly sort of to the tops of the wrappings and bindings just so there's a little bit of highlight. It looks like, you know, the light sort of hitting the top, you know. This is again, no blending required. It's just about carefully, you know, applying the color, some very fine, you know, bits of it here and there until you're satisfied with the result. And now I'm gonna be painting the spear or the yari itself, as it was called, I think, in Japanese. These came in various colors, which makes it a little bit fun. You know, it's not your typical uh, wooden spear shaft like you get on kind of European guys. This is way more fun. These were red, they were black, they were different colors. They were, you know, they had a finish to them. And I'm making my spear red in this case because it has a nice contrast then with everything else and it kind of works together. We get a nice unified color palette. You could have painted this earlier on when you were doing the other red elements of the uniform, but I've waited here because just because the spear is kind of an element that sticks out and you kind of tend to get paint on it while you're working on other things, so it's kind of better just to wait till later. So to start out, I'm just going to base coat it again with Vallejo Black Red, and then I'm going to be highlighting it again using the same Citadel colors. So I'm starting out here with Mephiston Red, and I'm gonna be applying it basically to the top of the spear, the heaviest, and then sort of blending it downwards along the sides. You can kind of apply several layers here and smooth it out. Just, you know, tr you're basically trying to get sort of a nice bright red towards the top, and then just make sure it fades down into more of a shadow along the bottom. And then I'm just going to finish off in the same way I did on the other red sections by taking the uh, Evil Sun Scarlet layer color and applying it again along the top of the spear and blending downwards uh, just to get an even brighter, higher red along the real top edge where there's a lot of light hitting the weapon. We're getting pretty close to being done. I want to take care of the metallic areas in this figure, which are very, actually not very many in this case. There's a little bit of sort of brass bronze on the sort of the guards of his uh, sword and dagger. And I'm just going to really quickly paint those using German camouflage black brown mixed in with some Vallejo Air Gold as a base coat and then highlight it in very quickly with a little bit of pure Vallejo gold. These are so small, you shouldn't have to spend more than a few seconds on it. The spear, I'm going to do by taking the German gray and mixing a bit of uh, Vallejo Air Steel into it as a base coat, and then once that's on there, I'm going to take pure Vallejo Steel and highlight it. It's a lot shinier, so I'm going to sort of make sure to, I apply it to the top side of the spear and kind of blend it downwards and blend it outwards so it's not too shiny or heavy. And I'm also going to make sure in this case that I emphasize it's sort of, there's sort of a center line in the middle of the spear blade. So I'm going to make sure I highlight one side more heavily than the other. So, you know, it looks like the light is sort of hitting one side and not the other. And it gives it sort of just a little bit more, a little bit more shape. Now this next step is optional, but samurai often had sort of unit symbols on their helmet or their front of their armor or both or neither. You'll have to research the unit you're painting to figure this out. I'm just doing something kind of arbitrary, even though I think it actually is a real symbol. I'm doing kind of a diamond for diamond pattern. So I'm gonna paint a big diamond, which is a mix of neutral gray and white. Then I'm gonna highlight it with pure white. And then I'm gonna take sort of a bluish German gray, so that basically the helmet base color, and I'm gonna make, sort of divide it with two lines now, which is gonna help me achieve that sort of smaller four diamond pattern, and this is gonna be easier than painting four separate diamonds by themselves. At this point, the figure is basically done, but there's something that I kind of like to do on this armor, it's optional, but you, I kind of like to do it. Since this armor is lacquered, that meant the finish was not really pure matte a lot of times. It was, it's kind of kind of be varying from very shiny to sort of, sort of glossy. 
Uh, I often, what I'll do is put, I'll actually apply a gloss varnish to, especially the scabbards of my swords, really to make them pop out. Uh, but with this kind of armor, you can actually apply a finish to the whole armor. And if you're not really brave enough to put gloss varnish on everything, because that really will make it pretty shiny, you can also compromise like I am here and use a satin varnish, which will give it a kind of a slightly shiny effect without, you know, really having to commit to a really, really, you know, glossy finish. So I'm just taking my uh, acrylic satin varnish here, which is from Vallejo, and I'm just going to carefully apply it to all the areas of armor and the scabbards. All right, here is our finished Yari Ashigaru painted in blue and red and gray, which are, you know, good colors that you would see fairly often in some variety in a Japanese army. Like I said, when you're making your color choices, you're obviously going to want to do more research than me and figure out exactly the livery of the particular army you're painting, the symbols that were used. But that's all stuff that you can find out pretty well online or in books by Osprey or whatever. Otherwise, I hope, you know, I hope this was a little bit useful in sort of demystifying the process of painting this type of unit, so Yashigaru or Samurai, because they basically have the same kind of armor, and I, probably what you can see here is it, there's nothing really, there's no real rocket science here, like I said before, it's really just about um, being careful and, you know, and being and taking your time and picking out details because it was as a matter of fact this this armor is actually easier than a lot of other things there wasn't all that much blending that we had to do here because there's so many just smaller segments and bits you don't really have to worry all that much about blending you just kind of apply your color maybe do an edge highlight that's the trickiest part and that's it and there's just so many small bits and pieces you never have to lavish a lot of time and attention on making some big area look good so there actually are some advantages here. It's, it's all just about having patience. That's what it comes down to. There's no secret, I think. But, you know, maybe, I hope at least my style of doing this particular unit maybe gave you some ideas. And you, I also think, you know, if, if you haven't thought of it already, adding a, a varnish or a, to the figure not only gives it protection, but in the case of these Japanese units, it actually sort of is an actual sort of detail in and of itself that sort of makes the figure more interesting. So anyway, as usual, I've probably talked too much here about this. If you like this video, uh, please leave likes, uh, share it, favorite it on Facebook, um, and leave me comments with what you thought, what you liked, what you didn't like, the usual. And you can always subscribe, of course, if you haven't already. I'll mention it every time because I want more subscribers. And yeah, I think that's about it. Um, I don't know. I may be doing more user request videos next week. I'm not sure. I want to see how you guys respond to this. But anyway, in any case, I will see you next week as usual. And until then, happy painting.